Hi everybody. These are short introductory videos to cover the main points that we would have discussed in person in a traditional face-to-face -face class. The full version of the lectures are available in the Blackboard coursework tab area in the Unit 3 folder. So we're now moving on to Impressionism. The movement is perhaps the single most important and certainly the first major modern style or movement. It really kind of sets the stage for modern art, for the art of the 20th century. And that stage was prepared for them in the last lecture with the work of Manet, M-A-N-E-T, with his important work from 1863, Le Déjeuner sur l'Eau, or The Luncheon on the Grass, which was one of the pieces that spurred Napoleon III to enact the Salon de Refusé, the exhibition of the rejected works. As you know, the academy was the way that artists were trained, and the way that the artists were judged was by annual exhibition, or Salon, and the members of the academy would view the submissions, vote on what was acceptable, what could be shown, what couldn't be shown, and then would vote on membership, electing people to hire levels of the hierarchy within the academy itself. So artists were sort of being vetted by this group, by the academic painters and through the salon system. So when Manet's work was rejected, as were many other artists in 1863, there was a public outcry about why were so many people rejected. So there was a big exhibition to show people what this terrible new art was like, and people disliked it. It was flat. It was too realistic. It was disproportionate. It wasn't neoclassical and it wasn't romantic. And so therefore people didn't know what to do with it. So there'd been sort of a revolution already happening and the Impressionists really looked to Manet as in some ways their spiritual predecessor, but Monet, M-O-N-E-T, is truly the star of the Impressionist movement and in fact gives the movement its name with the piece Impression Sunrise. And he tells you in his title what it is that he wants to achieve. He's not so much painting objective reality, he's painting tons of detail, he's painting the effect on him, the impression on him, the impression that the world makes as he views this spectacular moment of dawning sun. We see light on the water reflected at his eye. We don't see this painting in the same way that another painter would have created the same type of scene in a style like neoclassical or romantic. It's really about a quick impression. Open brushwork, very evident, obvious use of the brush, a fair lack of detail, and a massive amount of color reflected back and forth from object into background. It's a very different way of painting. All the other names on this list are artists who more or less painted in a similar way to Monet. We can consider them the Monet group. The second lecture on Impressionism will focus on Degas and the artists who graded more toward his style, which was a little bit more clear, more detail, a little bit tighter. Now, as important as Impressionism is to the development of 20th century art, we don't necessarily um, give Impressionists the credit that they deserve for how precarious their position was. We think of them as giants in the art world, but really they were sort of rebels who were a little bit looked down upon. Their group was a little bit disorganized in us. The artists did not all show together all the time, and in fact, as a group, the Impressionists only showed together in eight exhibitions between 1874 and 1886, and not all of the Impressionists were in every single one of those shows. In fact, Pissarro is the only one of the Impressionists to have work in all eight exhibitions. So the group was a little more fluid. People moved in and out. One of the things that's important, of course, to know at the bottom of the screen there, you see the term plain air, which means in the open air. That's how they painted on site direct observation. And of course, all of this is made possible by the introduction of paint in tubes. And that may not seem like a big deal, but really, if you think about it, artists prior to this had had to mix their own paints and store them often in glass jars. It would have been impossible, or at least very difficult, to carry all of that material 
onto a location far away from your studio. So the impressions are building on some of the things that the artists of the Barbasan generation had done, but they're pushing a little further as well in expression. We talked about the Salon, the annual or biannual exhibitions that the Academy controlled. We talked about the Salon de Refusay, kind of breaking that system. But take a look there in bold. You see that there were multiple exhibitions of rejected work, work rejected from the Salon, in the time frame that the Impressionists painted together. Now, there were plenty of artists in the movement who were really also um, deeply connected with photography. And what you see here on the left is a portrait of the realist painter Courbet. On the right, a portrait of Sarah Bernhard. These were made by Felix Nader, and he was a supporter of what the Impressionists were doing. So you could think about the Impressionists somewhat reacting to the camera. We now have a machine that takes an objective, realistic image. Maybe painters don't have to be realists anymore. Maybe paint could do something else now that the camera exists. I also wanted to mention that the final exhibition was organized and supported by an artist we'll see in this lecture, Bert Morisot. So the women in the movement were quite important in terms of not only their artistic contribution, but also their financial and organizational support. A lot of the exhibitions really depended on the work of Bert Morisot and the American artist who was part of this movement, Mary Cassatt. Here's the painting that kicks off the whole movement. This is Impression Sunrise by Claude Monet. And it's quite a remarkable painting in comparison to what we've been looking at. It's definitely not neoclassical. It doesn't have a strong uh, geometric structure. It doesn't have huge clarity and detail. It doesn't have big heroic nude figures in the foreground telling a moral story. And it lacks the romantic element. It doesn't have um, an over-the-top dramatic storyline of tragedy and lots of curvaceous movement of figures. In fact, what you see are blobs of paint that suggest the idea of a rising sun reflected in water. And in fact, that's really where Monet's title came from. When he was asked to put a title to it for vision purposes, he said, mm, impression sunrise. It's the impression that that uh, moment of daylight had on him. So you can see how the artists are painting much more quickly, more loosely, with more evident brushwork. They're trying to capture a fleeting moment. Detail is not as important to them as the effect of color. You'll also notice that a lot of the artists in the Impressionist movement had problems with their eyesight. Monet, in fact, will suffer from cataracts. We'll talk about that a little bit later. The other thing that the Impressionists are really known for doing is painting the same type of subject in series, multiple similar images, but at different times of day. And it shows you how you can capture the effects of daylight, how things seem to change from dawn to noon to late afternoon or into the evening. You can also see here in these train station paintings by Monet that he's painting the real world, that he's painting the everyday world, but he's painting the world of the Industrial Revolution. Things are changing because of the steam engine and the train and the factory. So it's a very, very modern approach. Here you can definitely see the effect of light on objects. This is the facade of Rouen Cathedral, and Monet painted a series of these images. They are all roughly the same size. There's 18 of them total, but you can tell different weather effects, different times of day. Look at how the stone of the cathedral seems to change from orange to blue, depending on where the light hits it, where the shadow is at different times of day. We know that Monet actually had an apartment across the street from the cathedral in order to paint these and he painted at very specific times. So he would devote a specific hour of the morning to the sunrise painting and then move on to a different canvas. We also have a series here of his later works toward the end of the century, his uh, lily pad paintings, the paintings of his garden. And they're unique landscapes in that you don't really see the horizon line with the sky above it. It's inverted. You see the sky reflected in the surface of the water. So it's an odd setup. They're quite large paintings, many of them, and they definitely have different 
color effects at different times of day, different seasons. Look at how the blue is different from one to the other. So you can see that he's using these surfaces as an excuse almost to explore or even invent a new way of expressing reality. The paintings become really large and they are installed here in a large uh, public space it gives you a sense of scale to see people with them these are photographs from the installation itself and you'll see here that they start to look like the size and even in some ways the style and texture of the art of the 1950s in america the abstract expressionist movement uses these large fields movement and color and it's partially to do with the inspiration of the work that you see here of the lily pad paintings by Monet. Monet was very honest about his painting and in fact we know that he suffered from cataracts. The particular type of cataracts that he had would have skewed his vision to filter the greens toward more of a red hue and so here we have his garden a Japanese bridge over the lily pads and you see that what he's doing here is really being honest to the colors that he actually was seeing because of the cataracts that he had we know after he had cataract surgery had the cataracts removed his colors go back to quote unquote normal it's kind of a remarkable story this is the work of Renoir, another one of the major players of the Impressionist movement. Not so much a father of Monet as someone who painted in a similar vein. You see here that the subject changes a lot. We have an outdoor um, cafe dance floor. What we're looking at is part of the leisure class that is possible because of the Industrial Revolution, and it was Ren uh, Renoir's preferred subject matter as well. He quite frequently chose subjects of romance and he shows people enjoying one another enjoying a drink and a dance in a social setting these settings are quite modern as well you're looking at the moulin de la galette moulin is a french word for windmill and there were a handful of nightclub slash cabaret that had windmills as their main architectural feature uh, you may have heard of the moulin rouge and so the moulin de that is another one of these cabaret situations. What you're looking at is an outdoor dance floor. You can see the light coming through the eaves overhead. If you look at the back of the figure in the foreground, the right-hand side, he's got light on his shoulder and on the back of his jacket. You get a feeling of immediacy of these things being in motion. And the brushwork, I think, kind of gives you that as well. Very often, Renoir includes his own friends in these images, and we can see that here as well. We know the identities of almost every figure in the entire painting. Some of them are famous actors. Um, some of them are relatives of the owner of this outdoor cafe that we're sitting in. And one of them, in fact, is a fellow painter from the Degas group of Impressionists. The painter Gustave Caibot is the artist in the straw hat at the far right-hand foreground uh, sitting at the right-hand corner. We know the identities. We can kind of identify them here via the chart as well. So he's painting reality for sure. Remember, Impressionism truly does come from realism, but it's realism with a very different stylistic approach. One of my favorites is Alfred Sisley. Sisley's paintings are perhaps the most authentic, I think, the most direct, observational, very, very logical. The painting uses much wider brush strokes than we've been seeing. If you look at the foreground, especially in the water, you can see the ripples of the water get smaller as we go back in space. You can also see that he's obeying all the rules of atmospheric perspective. The top of the painting shows you the sky in a really dark blue and it fades to much lighter blue as we get closer to the horizon. So this is definitely all observation-based work, but rather than doing sketch and working on this later or making it up from some pre-recorded observations. This is painting direct from nature. The artist Bert Morisot is sometimes criticized, as was Mary Cassatt, for painting female subjects, which I think is perhaps a sexist way of viewing what she's doing. Of course she painted the things familiar to her, just like the male artists painted things that they were interested in. But she often gives us these scenes of interiors, 
But more interestingly, this piece to know for the test is her image of a villa at the seaside. And it almost feels to me as though the light is so intense here, that bright sunlight feels almost like an overexposed photograph. You get this rich, intense feeling of almost binding intensity of light. You can see the figure coming up from the beach toward the right-hand side, climbing the stairs, has a parasol to protect herself. And you also get a feeling of the fluidity of the brushwork. If you look at the banister and the railings around this outdoor porch, you can see that nothing's rendered with an overly tight specific detail that you would see in the realist style. It's immediate, it's intense, it's a suggestion of light and form, and it feels joyful. The work of Pissarro is really quite intriguing. Pissarro is the only one who was in all eight of our exhibitions. You can see a very different approach to the brush here. It's almost more frantic. There's far more individual small dabs of paint all over the surface. But you still, although you don't have detail, you still have the feeling of being on a road in a woods, of being surrounded by trees and light filtering through those leaves. Pissarro was really interested in experimentation as well, and in fact fell under the influence of Surat, who is best known as a post-impressionist painter who invented a style he called divisionism, which we call usually pointillism, painting in dots. Take a look at Pissarro's pointillist pictures. He followed this path for a while, and you can see he's painting almost as you would with pixels. It sort of looks like the image on a television screen or another mobile device. If you were to look at it really close, you can see that colors are really blending in your eye from very small amounts of blues and yellows side by side. They appear to be green from a distance. So Pissarro followed this movement for a while and then changed back to a little bit more of an impressionist style. He too, much like the other, was interested in giving us multiple views of similar subjects under different circumstances, both in times of day and in seasons. So these paintings of the street near the opera is perhaps what he's best known for. And if you really take a look at the paintings individually, you can sense different times of day. This feels a little bit more like an earlier morning image to me, as opposed to this image, which feels as though we're under the beginnings of a pretty intense fog in the middle of the day. Notice there's not a lot of long shadows here. My personal favorite is this one. It is absolutely a beautiful image of reflection of light on water. It's been a rainy day and we're late in the day, so it's dark, cloudy. We see all the lights of the buildings in the street. Contrast that with almost the same composition, also in rain, but during the day. It's a completely different effect. The textbook offers you this piece, which is a little bit more unusual. It looks straight down at the ground. You don't have a horizon to look at or a sky to look at there, but it is the example the book uses for Pissarro's work. So again, with the Impressionist painters, especially the Monet group, try to focus on painting on site, painting en plein air, painting um, in dabs, and very evident brushwork. Think about the idea of not necessarily focusing so much on detail, the effect of on color of different light at different times of day.